thank you, Tony. Um, it was Jonathan Swift, um, an 18th century author, best known for uh, the novel Gulliver's Travel, who said, vision is the art of seeing what is invisible to others. And throughout history, there's been many examples of um, visionaries in science who've done just that, and as a result, revolutionized the way we um, view and understand nature. And in the field of engineering science, um, flow visualization, which has roots dating back to Leonardo da Vinci, really takes the cake in terms of making spectacular insights into fluid dynamics. In uh, structural mechanics, however, it's not so spectacular, mainly because things don't tend to move much. In fact, you know you're in trouble if, it, if the structure around <laughs> you move around. <laughs> but we are making a bit of a, a, a head start in, in that area. And I'd like to start with um, a simple demonstration. A paper specimen of this shape. Paper specimen is all I can come up with under the current budgetary constraint. <laughs> It's in the shape of a um, bowling pin with a hole cut in the middle of the, uh, the wider section. And if I were to ask you this, if I were to pull onto this until it breaks, where will it break? Actually, there are several alternatives or, or options if you think about it. It could break at where I'm gripping onto the specimen because that's where the lows are going in. Or it could break at the narrowest part, the neck. It could even break at where the hole is because we all kind of know holes are bad. Right? Let's see what happens. So it breaks at the hole. So, as I said, holes are bad. Well, why are holes so bad? Well, it turns out that holes, or loading a plate with a hole, has a fluid dynamics analogy. A little bit like fluid flowing past an obstacle, a bit like this around this tree stump here. You can kind of see all the streamlines bunching up around the, the hole, or sorry, the stump. So wouldn't it be good for us to see how stresses are distributed in a solid? Well, that call was answered um, about 30 years ago by a thing called the thermoelastic stress analysis. It's based on an effect uh, called, surprise, surprise, the thermoelastic effect. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of um, uh, characterized by Lord Kelvin back in 1853, uh, actually. So almost uh, 180 years ago, um, with this very simple equation, very elegant equation, which basically says that the change in stress or the temperature of a body is negatively proportional to the changes in stress. The, it's not unlike what happens in a gas, and we kind of all know that if you compress a gas, <coughs> it gets warm and expand a gas, it gets cooled. But the difference is that this proportionality constant is extremely small for a solid. So small such that for an um, aluminium, a structural type aluminium, by stretching it just before it starts to yield, only changes temperature by half a degree Celsius. So it's, it's been an effect that's been kind of overlooked for almost 200 years. I'm going to show you this, the thermoelastic effect in action. This is a plate with a central hole being cyclically loaded at one hertz. You can kind of see the, the specimen almost breathing. What you're seeing is, is viewed through an infrared camera. You're seeing the fl fluctuation temperature. That is the thermoelastic effect. You kind of see the, the fluctuations a bit more intense around the, hole, uh, the edge or the perimeter of the hole. And that's because the stresses are highest there. Through a bit of si a fancy signal processing, you can come up with actually a um, clear picture like that. Red spot showing very high stresses on the two sides of the uh, hole. And in fact, if you look at the numerical values of the red patches, that's some three times as high as the green bits. And that is why the paper specimen broke at the hole, even though the hole, or at that part, it was twice the width of the neck. OK, it works pretty well for a uh, specimen. Does it work for a real structure? And to answer that, I have to go back to 1991. Uh, one of our RAAF Orion had a, a fatal accident over the Cocos Island. During a high G pull-up, um, one of his wing leading edge actually failed. And it failed by a number of ribs in the wing leading edge snapping at this location here. This 
basically on the bottom lower leg. It's kind of snapped right through, through one of these so-called stiffening dimples. The dimples are just pressed out indentations just to stiffen the, the rib a bit. So, of course, one of the first things the investigators did was to do a uh, analysis, a stress analysis on what was going on in the rib. So here's the, the on the bottom right hand corner is the uh, analytical result or numerical result, a two dimensional result showing that uh, in fact, you know, there's high stresses right down at the bottom leg. But guess what? That's not where the highest stresses are. The high stress actually occurred right here at the upper right hand corner of the hole. Um, so what was going on? And in fact, the, the um, investigators had to apply a factor of three to make the, the model to fail where it is. Now see what happens, what TSA can do. This image was actually produced by an instrument we built back in 1993 in DSTO. At that time, it was 400 times better than the existing technology or faster than the existing te not technology. And it was this significant increase in scanning speed which allows such a specimen or such a large structure to be scanned. Uh, and it, it's got a lot of detail. Let me go through it so, so it all makes sense to you. Think of this rib being fixed on the two uh, legs on the right-hand side. And there's a lifting force being applied to the structure, causing the structure to try to turn clockwise. So pushing onto the top leg, compressing the top leg, and stretching the bottom leg. And basically, if you look at a uh, color scale, that's exactly what it's telling you. Lots of aquas and blues on the compression leg and lots of red and yellows and orange on the tension leg. Have a look at that, um, the corner of the cutout. What, there's a bit of high stress there, it's predicted by um, the, the model, but the high stress was actually where it broke. Now why are the stresses so high there? Well, the hint is there. If you look at the, where all the stiffening dimples are, right, it's khaki green. And if you look at the color scale, there's zero. What that was saying is that those stiffening dimples were actually not carrying the load. They were acting like holes. Remember, holes are bad. So all the, the um, uh, stresses had to be bunching up, skirt around it, causing the stress concentration. And that was quite a revelation at the time. Even the manufacturer, Lockheed, wasn't aware of this phenomenon. Here's a more recent example, re application. It's on the FA-18 bulkhead. The guys were interested at the stresses around a certain um, hydraulic line access hole. So what's shown on the right hand side is the overall scan of the, that region. And the bottom pictures show a comparison between the model, the guys did, and the TSA scan. And you have to agree that the, the comparison is just amazing. Now, being able to um, validate kind of expected uh, hotspots is one thing, but the fact that TSA allows you to just sit back and look wherever you want has some edge over modelling. When this was shown to me at the first time, my comments was this. Well, the, the numerical guys, they were quite good. They did a good job. But hey, I wouldn't worry about the whole. Cast your eyes back on the overall scan there. Look what happens on the right hand, uh, left hand end. Lots of red splashes of high uh, stresses. In fact, there's some even white hot sp spots showing you high, spot, uh, high stresses there. So my message has been that, you know, it's good to use this tool to validate models, but hey, you know, it can do a lot more. You can, you know, use it all the time. You should be looking for unknown unknowns, as uh, Axel uh, used the term. All right, here's an example uh, talking about looking for unknown or unknown unknowns or unexpected. It's a really good example, um, which only recently happened in our lab. It was uh, a specimen trying to study the um, effects of cracking in a riveted lap joint associated with one of our aircraft. The guys wanted to uh, study cracking between rivets. So they wanted to concentrate on just a set of four rivets. And they thought that, well, in order for the, the cracking to start there, let me have the second row of rivet um, by having a lot more rivets so to spread out the load to ensure the cracking will occur on the top. Okay, now before I continue this story, let me take a little um, digression here uh, to go back to one of my personal experiences 
in fact, goes back all the way to my school days, which happened probably a few moons back. Um, and it was associated with one of my year 11 physics exam questions. The, um, the, the question went something like that. A father driving his kid home from a fair and the kid sitting at the back holding a balloon in a, in a station wagon. One thing I want to point out here is that um, I know what you're all thinking. You're probably thinking that it's a cute little kid prone to falling asleep in all places. It's probably related to me. <laughs> well, you'd be all wrong because I just got this out of the internet. <laughs> So the lesson number one, never jump to conclusions. <laughs> okay, now picture this kid sitting more in the middle of the, the, the uh, back seat, okay? So the balloon is in the middle of the car. The question was, driving along, the father driving along, and suddenly a set of red lights come up. The father slams on the brakes. The question was, in which direction will the balloon move relative to the car during the deceleration? And the options were, a, forward of the car, B, staying where it is, C, backwards, D, left, and E, right. Now, I don't want to embarrass anyone here by asking <laughs> you for the uh, solution. Just keep that in your head for the moment. It turns out that the, virtually the whole class got it wrong by picking A because of our normal experience with inertia. The correct answer was actually C. Now, who got that right? Hand up. Very good, you're smarter than I was when I was in year 11. <laughs> the reason is that as the car slows, the air molecules, being heavier than the helium ones, all rush to the front, creating a, a drop in pressure at the back, therefore sucking the balloon backwards. So here's lesson number two, never jump to conclusions, especially using our everyday intuition, because small but important changes can throw us our intuition right off. Now let me get back to... Um, the rivet joints. Remember, the guys wanted the cracking to occur at the row of four rivets. Now, one thing these guys did right was that they uh, insisted or asked for TSA to be applied to this test. And guess what happens? The crack's not going to crack at the four rivets. So what was going on? It just doesn't make sense. Because how would the specimen know top and bottom? Because if you flip it at the other side, it'll be the, the top will be the bottom. When this was shown to me, I worked out what was going on in about five seconds, and not because I know anything about a riveted joints, because I don't. I wouldn't know how to design a riveted joint for nuts, but I do know how to read TSAs. One thing I noticed was that the mean stress on the top plate is much lower than the mean stress on the bottom plate, and that tells me that the top plate is heavy, uh, stiffer. And sure enough, the designer of this specimen was able to confirm to me that actually the top plate was thicker to simulate the spar of an aircraft, and uh, the thinner plate being the skin. Just to show you why that makes a difference, I've constructed a, a model of wood and a piece of rubber band just to exaggerate the stiffness difference. Guess what happens if you're going to stretch onto that thing, right? The rubber band just can't stretch in between the two pins because of the stiffer backing. So there's no way the top pin was going to see any uh, low. That's exactly what was happening to the riveted joint. Okay, now all these kind of fell into place, all these experience and lessons kind of fell into place for me when I was sitting in one of the JSF briefing sessions. At that time I didn't fall asleep for that particular one. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, a couple of things, they were talking about the woes that they had or they were having with the uh, JSF for fatigue tests. And one of the bulkheads broke after only one-tenth of the scheduled testing time. Which, and, and the reason for that, well, they didn't model it properly. The, the model lacked the detail, and so they got the stresses wrong. And that mistake delayed the program for one whole year. So they fixed that up, and so no sooner than the test re, um, reinitiated again, another surprise break happened on another component, this time only to about 15% of the schedule load. And again, it was due to um, lack of fidelity in the numerical models. And again, the fault caused a year's delay. And these two events alone caused the call for a delay or the slowdown of production for the um, JSF. And the cost of this, uh, f these faults, remedying these faults, 
cost it to three to five million dollars per jet. So what I've been advocating in recent times is that, you know, I te our technology such as that should be used on day one on a fatigue test, not just to validate um, finite element models, but to, to look for the unknown unknowns. Now, for, for this to happen, it might need to be kind of integrated with an autonomous robot like that. You know, it should be scouring around the, the, the our test article, you know, looking for design faults and looking for developing ones as well. And that's the message I've been um, um, drumming throughout the, for the last few months. And some manufacturers are actually heeding it. And be, um, Airbus has already started a team to look into my proposal. And, Air, uh, and BAE Systems wanted it demonstrated on the Hawk rig in Fisherman's Bend. So by the time it's all ready, perhaps it will be too late for the JSF. Um, but I'm pretty confident that by the time the next generation jet comes along, this will be the way how fatigue tests will be done. Thank you.